Hello from Bali, Indonesia. My name is Melati. I am 20 years old and a full-time change maker. Growing up on the beautiful island of Bali, Indonesia, I was constantly surrounded by nature, by the environment. Right now I'm currently recording this video from my garden. But another very, very, very strong reality that we saw growing up on the island of Bali was the problem of plastic pollution. It's simply everywhere. Now I'm holding a tiny piece of plastic, but here on Bali, the problem was massive. We couldn't go, you know, a, a car ride to school without looking out the window, without seeing plastic. We couldn't go for a walk on the beach without seeing plastic, big pieces, small pieces, plastic bottles, straws, styrofoam, you name it, we could see it. It was a very strong reality growing up here on the island of Bali. It's not quite the picture-perfect image you first think of when you think of Bali. But at the age of 10 and 12, with, together with my younger sister, it wasn't rocket science to start seeing that there was a problem and the growing feeling of we had to do something. So without a business plan, without a strategy, together with my younger sister, we set out on our first mission, Bye Bye Plastic Bags with the goal of making the island of Bali plastic bag free. This was lesson number one and still a strong lesson that I think we need to see more of in today's activism and environmental spaces. Being very clear in what you want to achieve. What is the goal you want to see? What is the change you want to see? The more specific, the more clear, the more easier it is for people to understand on what practical changes they can do, whether an individual or a policymaker. And that's where lesson number two comes in. We need all levels of the community to be able to create change. We know certainly that change doesn't happen overnight, but it will most definitely not happen if we do not work together. So collaboration, Coming together as a community, that was our top priority with Bye Bye Plastic Bags. And although we were a youth movement, we could see the momentum that we were building here on the island of Bali and very soon after becoming a global movement of young people where today Bye Bye Plastic Bags can be found in 50 locations in 30 countries, all led by young kids who believe that they can stand up and have their voices heard for the environment as well. I have a little, sorry, I was a bit distracted because I had a, a chicken coming. I don't know if you can see it. Anyways, to the point, lesson number one was be clear, be specific in your goal. Lesson number two, bring that community aspect, work together, work with like-minded, and also learn from the other people's perspectives on why it's so difficult to change. And last but not least, and I think the strength that a youth movement such as Bye Bye Plastic Bags can bring to accelerating these goals is thinking outside the box, being creative, being bold, being different. It's really that ability to think outside the box, think beyond business as usual, that will allow us to not only be as innovative as possible, but also accelerate the change we wish to see. So. My advice and what I hope to see more of on a global scale for all organizations, people in positions in power is actually invite us young people to the meeting rooms, to the brainstorming sessions and allow us to help brainstorm, allow us to help shape ideas, shape regulation, and then help you implement those goals. Empower the youth, empower the people in your communities, invest in alternatives, invest in people, and make sure that we are having circular, sustainable, long-term solutions. Wait, one second, here's the chicken. I wasn't lying. <laughs> he was actually making so much noise in the leaves on the background of me and I was getting distracted, but I wasn't lying, there is a chicken. But anyways, Going back to the point of including young people from the very start, allowing us the space to innovate, become entrepreneurs, you know, think big, ask big and hard questions, but also help implementation. That is the way we need to be moving forward. We do not have the luxury of time. And our generation knows that. We not only feel the urgency, we not only see the challenges, but we also know the opportunity of how and why we can move forward 
to a future that we are proud of. So, us kids may only be 25% of the world's population, but we are 100% of the future. Change can start today, and it can start with you. Hello, and welcome to our session on cross-industry collaboration, turning off the tap on ocean plastic pollution. Wow, thank you, Malati, for illustrating the importance of stopping plastic pollution and highlighting how we all can and need to be change makers. My name is Kendall Starkman and I am the director of Next Wave Plastics, a consortium of multinational brands convened by the nonprofit Lonely Whale. Next Wave Plastics member companies are, um, including the three that are joining me here today, are developing a global network of ocean-bound plastic supply chains and demonstrating that recycled ocean-bound plastic has commercial value by integrating this material into their products and packaging and collaborating together for greater impact. Today, I am joined by an incredible panel of leaders in their companies representing these powerful brands who are taking a really serious look at material use and how their actions and decisions can turn off the tap on marine plastic pollution. Before I have the honor of introducing them to you and giving up the floor so that they can share their stories of collaboration and innovation, I first wanted to take a moment to talk about what's really, what brings these three diverse companies together here today, um, along with seven other members of the Next Wave Plastics Consortium. And this is really the recognition that they each have a role to play in turning off the tap on plastic pollution and a shared desire to demonstrate that material that is currently considered waste has value in a circular economy. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about Next Wave Plastics. Next Wave was founded in 2017 um, with uh, many of the companies that you see here joining us along the way over the past three years with this commitment to come together in a collaborative um, forum and in the spirit of transparency and um, shared knowledge to develop the first global network of ocean bound plastic supply chains. This has led to the development of products that are made with recycled ocean bound plastic um, like many of those that you see here on this slide. Um, it's, and really the, the exciting thing about ocean bound plastic is that it can really go across this diversity of industries. So that's why we have this cross industry collaboration and forum that we're able to pull together resulting in um, you know, real live products that you can interact with every day, um, but that also have incredible impact on the ground with communities who are really on the front lines of um, the marine plastic pollution crisis um, and experience that every day. Um, we come together to share information um, and to be able to scale beyond what any one company might be able to do on their own. And that is by you know, sharing information on supply chains, on experience, working with this recycled content um, and more. Our panelists today will tell you all about it. Um, but as of October 25th, 2018, um, these companies have committed to uh, diverting at a minimum of 25,000 metric tons of ocean bound plastic from entering the ocean by the end of 2025 in pursuit of SDG 14.1, which specifically addresses um, the need to protect our marine resources um, and environments through uh, including through the use of reduced marine debris. We know that over 8 million metric tons of ocean bound plastic or ocean plastic is, is, sorry, we know that over 8 million metric tons of plastic is entering the ocean every year. And that's equivalent to about one garbage truck of plastic being dumped into the ocean every single minute. This rate is on track to triple by the end of 2040. Um, but really to turn the tide on this trajectory, um, our companies are working hard to demonstrate the value of this material. So I'm excited to introduce them all to you so that they can really take the stage and demonstrate how their 
really bringing this initiative to life um, and creating impact. Today, I have with me Ellen Jakowski, the Chief Sustainability and Social Impact Officer at HP Inc., um, as well as Jane Abernethy, the Chief Sustainability Officer at HumanScale, and Guy DiMaggio, the Senior VP and General Manager of Secure Card and Sustainability Services at CPI Card Group. Um, thank you all so much for joining me here today. I am thrilled to be able to have this conversation with you and to dig into more of the impact that you've each individually been able to achieve and really what you could do together. Um, so I'll kick it off with a question um, that just to let, will allow each of you to kind of tell us a little bit about what each of your companies are doing to turn off the tap on ocean plastic by integrating ocean bound plastic into your company's supply chains. Um, Ellen, we'll start with you. I'd love to hear a little bit about HP and the unique um, approach that HP is taking to ocean bound plastic. Great, thanks Kendall. So excited to be here with all of you today having this really important discussion. So HP is a company that uses plastic as a current ingredient in many of our products. And because of that, we have a clear responsibility to do as you say, to turn off that tap on plastic pollution. And to that end, as part of our overarching sustainable impact strategy, which includes a focus on our planet, its people and the communities we serve, we've developed a strategy specifically to guide us in our plastic reduction process. Uh, it has five steps. So the first step is to eliminate plastic wherever possible. And to that end, we set a goal to reduce single use plastic packaging by 75% by 2025. After we've considered, can we eliminate that plastic? The second step in the strategy is to think about choosing more sustainable options, moving away from plastic to newer materials like uh, recyclable molded pulp. And our packaging is a great place to do that. The third step in our strategy is to replace virgin plastic with recycled content wherever possible. And we've established an industry leading goal uh, in 2019 uh, to use 30% post-consumer recycled plastic in our products by 2025. And we're well on our way to achieve that industry leading goal. The fourth step is to source recycled plastic from locations where it has the greatest impact. And this is where our approach to the ocean bound plastic solution comes into play. So I'll talk more about that in just a second. Uh, but lastly, then the fifth step, to make sure our customers are enabled to recycle all of their HP products through our Planet Partners program. And we offer that recycling uh, in over 79 countries worldwide. So we're really thinking holistically about plastic, how we can reduce it and be more responsible as a company. But I'm gonna go back to that, that step number four of where we choose to source our recycled plastic from. And we do use quite a bit of recycled content. And again, our goals uh, ensure that we are raising the bar on ourselves every day. Um, so for example, if I talk about the HP ink cartridge, this is a process of closed loop recycling that we've had for over 15 years. And with that process, we disassemble the ink cartridges that our customers send back to us through our Planet Partners Recycling Program. And then when we disassemble that, we crush up the old plastic shell of the ink cartridges and we mix them with bottle plastic. We make a lot of ink cartridges. So the scale on which we do this, we use over a million bottles a day in that process recycled plastic bottles. And when we were thinking about what location should we source this from? Is there an opportunity to have more sustainable impact if we think strategically about that location? The answer was absolutely yes. So we started sourcing it from Haiti, set up a collection process with that island nation where they do not have municipal garbage collection. So a truck doesn't come around once a week like it does at my home or some of yours as well. Uh, instead, that refuse goes on the ground into canals, out into the ocean. Um, and for us to be able to set up this collection process, we can prevent that plastic from flowing in the ocean. To date, we've sourced more than 60 million bottles of ocean bound plastic into our products. We have that now starting with the HP ink cartridge where where that was our first product we attempted it with, we've now scaled that. Uh, and that ocean bound plastic is now in more than 50 HP products. 
We have the world's first notebook with ocean bound plastic, the world's first display monitor that uses ocean bound plastic. Now again, over 50 HP products that are using this material. And our intention is to continue to scale. So lots of opportunity. We've learned a lot of really good lessons in how to set up that supply chain um, and are really thrilled to be able to share it with others across industries like the consortium at Next Wave. Wow, thank you, Ellen. Um, it's always so inspiring to see just the scale of impact that you've been able to have and integrating it into HP's business really holistically. Um, I'll hop to Jane next. Tell us a little bit about human scale and your approach to um, you know, using ocean bound plastic in your industry. Mm -hmm. So human scale is a premier manufacturer of uh, ergonomic tools. And a lot of times those would be sold into office spaces. Um, these days we're seeing them, a lot of more of them going into homes just with the current, uh, a lot of people working from home these days. But traditionally we would have been selling to, you know, and, and talking with a lot of uh, architects and designers and specifiers that would be outfitting office spaces. Um, our products are long life products, so they're warranted for 15 years. Um, so they last, you know, a really long time. And so when we were looking at kind of how do we um, affect this space, when we're looking at, you know, an individual making a purchase, usually you're purchasing one or a small number for yourself when you're outfitting a whole entire office, that scales up that decision making process. And really, you know, working within the bu building industry is kind of an interesting place to look at moving the needle in sustainability, because some of these decisions can be scaled up in a way that they aren't necessarily for individuals. Um, with our long life products, we um, uh, have a, an interesting opportunity to use some plastics that are also long life. And we found a really good source of fishing nets, you know, that are made from a durable plastic um, and which is really fantastic for fishing nets to last as long as possible. Unfortunately, um, at the end of their useful life as a fishing net, a lot of times they are discarded into the oceans just because that infrastructure is not there to recapture back those those fishing nets after use. It's, it's not um, the fault of any individual uh, community or, or fishing fisher. Um, it's really just that the infrastructure is very commonly not found to recapture back the fishing nets and reuse them. So we've worked with a, a number of different partners. We started with one and we've scaled up to, to work with additional partners to recapture back fishing nets, which is a, a high grade engineering material that is made from and have them melted down, turned into pellets, you know, we then melt them and turn them into chair parts and turn them into um, chairs. And um, from what we can tell, fishing nets, uh, there are different estimates, but we've seen it estimated that uh, around 20% of ocean plastic is actually discarded fishing nets. So it's a really high volume of material. The other thing with fishing nets is that they are um, some of the most uh, impactful because they're designed to catch fish, of course, and they continue to do this. Uh, they catch fish and marine life for you know possibly hundreds of years after they're released. They land on coral reefs and and um, break the coral reefs and inhibit the sunlight and they they just cause a lot of damage to the ecosystem in the ocean. So it's really been a focus of ours to work with you know some of the worst kind of of ocean plastic, which is also that the thing that makes it so um, unfortunate in the ocean is that it lasts so long, but that is actually a benefit when we can pull it out and use it in our products because we do want our products to last for a long time. The other part that I, I just thought I would mention is um, sort of a, a slant that kind of comes from being in the building industry the conversation around what are the ingredients that go into the products is starting to be more prevalent I'm seeing in the building industry and people are looking at setting out office spaces and setting out kind of building uh, buildings as, in general. They're looking at also at what are the ingredients going into those spaces. And this seems to be an interesting conversation for the circular economy as well. And so that's one thing we do dig in very deeply into what are the ingredients that go into all of our products, including the ocean recaptured material as well. So we work with our suppliers to understand, you know, what exactly is in that material. Um, we do a lot of lab testing and finding out where the material is originally coming from. Um, nicely with fishing nets, you know, there's a limited number of different types of materials that get used. And so looking at, you know, when you're wanting to reuse a material, validating that it's um, what those ingredients are. So there's nothing that's of concern that's going to be reused again and again. Then we're, con you know, confident that when it gets reused a second time and a third time, it's something we want to keep in circulation. Um, when we look at some materials that may have been from a few decades ago, we might want to look at them and say, you know, potentially we don't want to, um, retire some of those older materials. Um, and then we are also uh, working with 
you know, scaling up. Um, so we have started with one original uh, supplier, Boreo, in, in South America. We've scaled up to include additional suppliers. We're um, launching and have not yet launched, but we're working on, on launching probably in the next short while, we'll be launching additional products that include ocean plastic as well. So the, the you know, uh, initial product that was launched was never intended to be, that's it, we've done it and we've solved the problem. It was really seen as a, a proof of concept um, to understand the whole process, understand how that interaction happens and then scale up to include this in as many products as possible. Thank you, Jane. Uh, yeah, and thanks for really bringing in that perspective about the material ingredients and what's really going into that. Um, human cells really leading the way at taking a close look at that. So thanks for being here. Um, Guy, it's your turn. So shifting over to financial services, uh, tell us a little bit about how CPI approaches ocean bound plastic and integrating that into your products and the unique perspective you guys bring. Great, thank you, Kendall, and, and greetings to all. Uh, so at CPI, we are a, a payment card manufacturer. Uh, we are a part of an industry that manufactures over 6 billion payment cards um, around the globe. So we, as a, I'll refer to us as a small to mid-sized company, we took an approach of what can we do um, that would have the biggest impact in terms of scale and in volume. So where we immediately shifted our focus was to the product. Uh, this is what we... Uh, put out in the marketplace on behalf of our customers, millions and millions and millions. So we created a card, a payment card with a core that is made of a recovered ocean bound plastic uh, material. So with that, our approach was how do we do something strong, making a, as, as big of an impact as we can in the sustainable space. And at the same time, help our clients in particular, our bank clients, connect, if you will, with their eco-conscious consumers. And so that led us to us generating this product. We, in particular, we focused on a, a form of plastic that is lesser collected. It's referred to as HDPE uh, plastic. So what we've done is by taking that and putting it into the core of our card, which functions, looks, feels, and functions, I should say, just as a traditional uh, the PVC plastic type of credit card or debit card. What we've done is we've been able to, by our estimates, for every 1 million of our second wave cards that we manufacture, that it removes roughly one ton of ocean bound plastic. So we now, I'm proud to say, we have north of 25 million cards manufactured and out in the market. And so uh, for a company our size, again, still early days, but we're very proud to be in a position where we feel we've been able to uh, recover 25 tons of plastic out of the waterways. And, and for us, it is uh, as, as similar to Jane's comment, it's, it's not a one and done. Uh, these are early days for us. We expect and we are working on generation, multiple generations of a second wave card. And we're also developing a menu of sustainable products uh, over the next coming months and years for customers to, uh, to select from. So we're, again, early days, but we feel good about where we're at right now. Yeah, thank you, Guy. So we've heard about how each of these companies are working to use otherwise ocean-bound plastics. And we often frame plastic pollution as an environmental issue, but it is also so essential to consider the impact for communities where the plastic is being collected. So next up, I am delighted to be joined by Richardson Antoine, country manager for First Mile in Haiti. First Mile is a critical impact partner for both HP and CPI card groups, ocean bound plastic supply chains. And they're there to really make sure that um, these systems put people first. So hi Richardson, welcome. Hi Kendall, thank you for having me in this platform. Absolutely. So we'd love to hear a bit about the vital role you play in the ocean bound plastic supply chain and the real um, and the impact that that has on communities and livelihoods. Can you share with us a bit about your experience in Haiti? Well, um, I've been working in the sector for nearly a decade. Um, I've been witnessing a lot of things that were that is happening right now on the ground in the country. 
So my role is to um, monitor and update the first mile database and uh, implement programming that is really necessary in the communities where we're working. So my responsibility is also to make sure that there is a good connection between the aggregators and the local facility to make sure that they have a good connection, that everyone is on the same page to make sure that the network is getting better, better every day. But I also connect constantly with the collectors and the aggregators so that they develop a friendly and um, good relationship because there is transaction that is happening. They need to um, know about healthcare, how to protect themselves. There are trainings that I am providing to them to make sure that they know how to manage cash, how to take care of their families, how to manage a ledger, how to really have uh, an understanding of the collection and all the hazards that are accompanying to it. So my responsibility is basically on the ground. I meet all these people, um, getting to know their families, to know how they're living, because the reason is because they can't put food on the table and we're here to help them as we can to get this. So um, this is basically what I'm doing. Wow, so you're, you're really coming in to assist on a for like financial education, for healthcare, for you know other other services that help to to provide them with greater resources. Can, can you give, can you help set the stage a little bit to tell us more about what the conditions are in Haiti and what the um, the recycling system looks like that First Mile works with? Well, um, the Environment and uh, you know Haiti is one of the poorest country in you know uh, in the in the Caribbean and uh, we're as other countries we're facing a lot of problems. Um, people don't really know how to manage um, the waste. They are not really educated, and you can see on the streets that somebody just throws something and then throw it away uh, in the streets. So when it's ran. All these plastic bottles, all the waste, go to the storage, collapse the candles, and go to the landfill or straight to the ocean. That creates a lot of problems for the ecosystem. When the plastic goes to the ocean, that causes that the, um, the sealers, they can't give you know, food to their children. That causes a lot of problems on the um, ocean ecosystem. So in order to um, improve that, that's the reason the first mile is on the ground. And uh, we're trying to um, get more people on board, but um, in, a, in, a, in a good manner. Um, we have a lot of um, collectors, aggregators in the country. Um, we have about four local facilities. Um, things are not really looking great, but as we're moving forward, we um, concentrating our efforts to make it better, but the condition is not really good, but it was worse um, before that we getting into it. And that's the reason that I appreciate the fact that I am on the platform to mobilize people and thank you for this opportunity for me to talk to the world and say that we need help because the envir environment problem is not only for Haiti, it's for everywhere in the world. Absolutely. So then you know if we really could harness this opportunity and this moment as a turning point for Haiti and for the environment, what do you think other companies could do to join these efforts and help to support the work that First Mile is doing? Other companies should uh, first start um, contacting with the organization that are already um, doing a great job in the country, such as First Mile. They should, um, you know, um, support this kind of initiative that you at STD is undertaking to mobilize the world to know about it because there are a lot of great things that is happening here in the country, but we can't do it alone. We need the support, the assistance of these big companies to accompany us and that would help us to get a greater impact. This company would have good data of what's going on, not only where they're involving, but around the world. We can do that because we already have good organization that is working here 
So having the assistance and support of the, of the big companies that will be very, very welcome and that will be helping thousands of people that, is, that are waking up in the morning at four, go to the landfill, to the kennels in the order to put food on the table and roof over the head. Just imagine how, what if we have hundreds of companies, thousands of companies to help us doing the work that we're doing. The world would be better and everybody would be really feeling great to know that they were invested in the work that we're doing and here is the results and the world would be happy and better. Wow, thank you Richardson for that. Um, I'm, it's really great to hear your perspective. So we've talked about what Next Wave member companies are doing and we've heard from Richardson about the impact on the ground. So um, now it's time to dig a little bit into the meat of how this happens, how collaboration um, comes into play in this whole process. You've all signed up as members of Next Wave to work across industries, sometimes with competitors, on this issue of ocean-bound plastic and finding ways to bring value to this material so that um, it is collected rather than um, wasted. And um, so I'd love to hear kind of what is the role of collaboration with other companies and other partners that in, in order to actually really be successful in achieving these goals um, and achieving greater diversion of ocean bound plastic and being success, successful at getting this into more products more successfully. I don't know if anyone wants to dive in first. Um, Guy, I know you are kind of already on this train, so maybe you can kick us off. Sure. Um, so for, from, our, from our perspective, the, the lens through which we see this, um, collaboration is absolutely paramount. Um, it, it helps on a number of different business fronts, from the knowledge sharing to the ability to lock in supply chains to understand those supply chains, the nuances that come with it. So and I know I'll just encompass it by saying all the operations uh, that come with that, the learnings that you get when you collaborate allow us to move much, much faster and quite frankly, not make mistakes that otherwise we would have made if we tried to do it on, on our own. In our case, the, the partnership that we have with uh, HP, the collaboration that we had there, Ellen and her team were absolutely fantastic, wildly generous with their time and their guidance and knowledge sharing with us. And had it not been for them, I'm very confident that we'd, we wouldn't have been able to have moved as quickly as we had done. And quite frankly, um, I think we, it would have taken us longer and, and the product would have suffered. So again, you know, clearly my thanks. And then the partnerships that we have with with Next Wave and, and, and First Mile, it just, it goes on and on and on. But one key thing that we didn't anticipate when I refer to the knowledge sharing of the information was we were able to, I mean, the light bulb went on for us because we, when we talked about knowledge sharing, we were thinking it was just gonna be very operational. How do you do this and how can we do that? But the conversations got way beyond that in, a, in an unbelievably beneficial way. So it really opened our eyes to, we can do other types of products. We should take a look at how we do this internally. And, and so it really was a snowball in a positive way, a snowball effect of, of broadening our understanding of what we can do, what we can do now, what we should be doing and what we expect to be doing in the next 12 to 24 months and, and beyond. Wow, that's awesome. Ellen, can you tell us a little bit more about H HP's side of that? Um, sure. Well, you know, similar to the sentiment that Guy just shared, there's no way HP could be where we're at on our own. Um, it took, you know, uh, a strong collaboration with NGO partners and other experts on the ground in Haiti in particular. You know, we know about setting up a supply chain, right? We have an over $50 billion supply chain uh, that functions, you know, globally. So that is an area of strong competency for our company. But what we don't know is, uh, you know, about how to set up a collector community. We don't know about the local sensitivities in Haiti and what's needed um, and, and how to work successfully in that particular community. So it was essential that we found some of the strongest and best partners that we that we did. So fortunate um, groups like the First Mile Coalition or Thread International, um, Work.org, an NGO partner who's helped us set up 
up classrooms for the kids of our collectors down there um, so that we could you know, think more holistically about what is needed for that collector community. Um, so the, the progress that we've been able to make, you know, to use over 60 million bottles to date, um, to then open up what we've done there and share it, for example, with Guy and, and um, those at his company so that they could join the effort too. It, you know, it really takes this broad team of experts. Um, so it was, it was a really important point for us to look at what are we good at, what skills and competencies we're bringing, and then who do we need to partner with to really complement the skills that we have and kind of fill those gaps. So, you know, as we continue to learn about what works and what doesn't, um, we're definitely going to be sharing that kind of in an open source way. Um, because for us, right, you know, this problem is so severe, it is so big, it is growing. Uh, for us to tackle it, you know, we need the entire world focused on how to solve the ocean plastic pollution problem together. So this is one piece of work that we're very happy to share. Um, and to that point, we also partnered with UL, so a standard setting uh, company that helped us take the work we did in Haiti and create an ocean bound plastic standard so that everything is kind of written down of how we worked with the collector community, how we set that up, how we thought about the environmental health and safety issues that we needed to kind of bring in um, into to this area that hadn't had to kind of follow some of those types of uh, rules, if you will, before. So, um, so this new standard that we've developed with UL, again, is another way to take what we've learned and to share it out so that others can follow um, and learn from what, what we've learned to date. Yeah, and, and bring some more like formalization and to the system so that others can jump jump on board because there's there are kind of like rules of operating. Um, I think part of it too is not just not just like having those rules of operating, but also integrating um, the that perspective that you guys have had on um, the social implications as well, and making sure that that doesn't get lost as people start to pay attention to the value of ocean bound plastic, that it's not about the material, it's about the people as well um, who are involved in this supply chain. And I think HP has done a really incredible job of maintaining that, that focus. Yeah, that's exactly right. This connectivity between you know, poverty and pollution is, is a clear one. And if you only look at it through one lens, you're not gonna truly create that systemic change. Um, you might solve one tiny piece of the problem, but you won't really solve it. So I think having that holistic perspective about, um, you know, the entire system, the community, the people that are part of what you're trying to solve, I think that's really key. Absolutely. Jane, do you have anything to add about how collaboration makes this possible for human skill? Yeah, just one thing that's uh, worth kind of noting is the collaboration really does send a signal to the, you know, folks who are potentially thinking about being, being suppliers or if someone is you know, working in this area that, and they know that there are a number of different large companies that are looking for a similar kind of material, it's worth it from them from a, from a business point of view. So it helps that that infrastructure get built just knowing that, that we we'll kind of have a united voice to say that this is actually something that we are committed to using and that we actually are asking for. So it, it drives that demand that then, you know, uh, um, helps create a, an industry of recycled ocean materials. Yeah, yeah, it definitely, and remembering that this is part of like a market system um, and that, that part of it is about the economics and so driving, sending the right message and, and driving that forward. Um, which brings us to the uh, question about comp competition too um, and, and how the role that that plays in um, market-based systems. Um, it's obviously important. It is still one of the values that, you know, we continue to push at, at Next Wave that there, there's still value in competition. And two of you guys have competitors that are members of Next Wave Plastics. Um, so I, so that Ellen and Jane, Dell Technologies and Herman Miller are competitors of yours respectively. Um, I, I think this is, is pretty, you know, rare in many cases in, in consortiums like this, but what is it about ocean bound plastic that brings you and your competitors to the same table? And how does that mix of collaboration and like competition, you know, really influence your work in this space? Yeah, I'll just say, you know, there are some problems, right, that are so big. Uh, again, we can't solve them alone. And, 
if our industry together can help solve a problem um, that we know we need to, like for example, climate change or ocean plastic pollution, um, this is the time when you work together no matter what. And um, it's been phenomenal to have Dell at the table with HP um, to be able to together, you know, share our learnings and best practices and move the needle together. Um, we know as an industry, uh, and as a society, we have to change how we consume uh, products and then as companies, how we manufacture uh, what we make and really drive towards a circular regenerative economy. And the only way that truly fundamentally is going to change is when competitors like HP and Dell work together to create that change. So it's a really exciting space and you know, kudos to Next Wave to creating a culture within the consortium that really works well to have all of us together at the table. Absolutely, thank you. Yeah, I think I would, would uh, reiterate that, that there are some things that are just too important. And I do find the conversation around sustainability not limited to ocean plastic, but sustain many topics in sustainability do require that conversation to be more than just an individual company. And so, you know, it's nice to sit at the table with Herman Miller as well. I, I do find we're also in the same conversation around sustainability with them and with a few other competitors, um, you know, around a number of other topics like circularity and like healthy ingredients. And, and you know, through BIFMA, the trade organization, we have a lot of conversations around sustainability. So um, this is one where it's, it's um, you know, it, it is really something we can't have in a vacuum. Each company can't have their own approach to ocean plastic, but also many of the different topics in, in you know, in sustainability and how we're gonna create a, a future that we wanna to live in a future that's where we're all gonna thrive. That's gonna take collaboration within competitors and then also across industries as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, great. Well, I love the spirit of that. I mean, really, Next Wave Plastics and bringing you guys together is based on this framework of knowledge sharing and transparency, and then creating a place where there is this ability to share information and, and bring together, um, you know, resources and tools to accelerate impact. Um, and the, and, and the actual work that each of you guys are doing is really where the the rubber is hitting the road and actually like making this possible and and we're really here just to help to push fo forward that as much as possible um so we have a few more minutes and i want to make sure that we capture the the like you know any any sum up thoughts that you guys have um i'd love for each of you maybe to leave us with a little bit um of, from you about what how members of this audience can implement some of the principles we've talked to today to achieve common goals and as they're proactively looking to address sustainable development goals, maybe not just limited to SDG 14, but um, above and beyond in, in more of a cross-cutting sense. Um, what is it that I haven't asked you that you wanna leave our, our audience with today? Guy, maybe we'll start with you. Sure, sure, thanks Kendall. Um, so a couple things. One, as it pertains to the goals, um, my my advice would be pick a pick a point and start. Right, um, as as we've heard Ellen and Jane say, the, the problems are so large, right? And the fact that you know you, we could all sit and just overthink it and overthink it. I think you, in our case, we looked at it and, and we said, okay, there's these one or two SDG goals. They really resonate with us. We really focused on two because we wanted to create a, a roadmap for ourselves. The first, you know, number one, we're going to tackle first and then move on to number two. So we, we, our focus, number one, of course, was on reducing the, the, the ocean plastic. So that would be my, my first bit of advice in terms of as an organization, if you're worried about um, where do we start, this problem is so big, pick a point and just kind of move from there and, and the momentum will build. In terms of for uh, being sharing information and being transparent. From, from our perspective at CPI, when, when we got involved in this, what we did with our product, we took the concept of our product and went out to our customers. We spoke with a number of customers and said, here's what we're thinking about doing. And the responses we received were absolutely overwhelming. In, per, in particular, one of the largest banks 
uh, in the United States was very, very keen on supporting us. So by having that information, that feedback, that positive feedback from our customers, we had a lot of confidence to make the investments that we needed to move forward. So again, one, I would say, pick a point and, and start, kind of go from there, don't overthink it. And the other would be in our case, if you're starting with a product, a, a consumer facing product, get feedback from your customers, you'd be amazed. Uh, I believe you'd be amazed at the, at the support that you'll receive. Thank you, Guy. How about Jane, what's your perspective? I would agree with, with Guy on just starting and building momentum and not trying to tackle everything at once. Um, the other thing I wanted to add, and we're getting close to the time here, is just that a lot of these changes um, are really cultural changes. And we found like that actually working with the plastic from an you know, engineering point of view, we go through the same engineering process. It's really about you know, working with our sourcing teams, working with our suppliers, working with you know, all the different um, folks involved. And that happens across the board, no matter what kind of change you're trying to make. So really focusing on that culture change and how to get people on board is really um, you know, getting people in, engaged and, and, and um, you know, excited about the project that you're working on, excited about the outcome and understanding why it's meaningful and impactful can, can really go a long way to keeping the momentum going and making things happen. Wonderful, thank you. Ellen, bring us home. Sure, so you know, from our perspective, this is the decisive decade, right? The UN calls this the decade of ecosystem restoration. We know the science is clear. We have 10 years and we better start right this moment. So Guy couldn't agree more, it is about action. It's important to set goals, but if you do not start creating that change within your own company, as an individual, within your community, now is the moment where we all need to really look very clearly at the actions and the change we need to create. So the systemic change, uh, Jane, that you just referenced, couldn't agree more. It's, it really is a culture shift. Which materials are we using to make our products? What are we choosing to consume? What suppliers are we working with to make them? Are they the most sustainable? Are we pushing our entire value chain to really change their habits, to change how they produce things, to change how they function, to be more sustainable? This is the moment and we all need to step up. And again, thank you to Next Wave for creating a forum for all of us to do that together. And we need more of that. It is truly about collaboration because we won't do this alone. It's going to take all of us, competitors working together, governments and communities working together, individuals, uh, all of us. So um, just wanna leave you with that. Uh, hopefully you'll feel some of your own momentum to create the change that you know we all need to do today. Wow, thank you, Ellen. So we've heard it from the brands, but Richardson, from your perspective, what is one key takeaway that you'd like to share with the audience on how collaboration across industries can help meet common goals? Well, um, collaboration is something that we really need. And if we really want to have a greater impact not only in Haiti or Honduras or other countries, but if you really want to have a greater impact, we have to think of those people. These 73 years old women that wake up early to collect some pounds of plastic, that person goes there because he knows that he can put food on the table. Just think of those people, those young men that don't have any other opportunity then go to the kennels collecting plastic. They could have done something bad, but in order to save their dignity, they create their own job. There is a big opportunity that collaboration should be really, really helpful. Think of these 100,000 people all over the world that don't have you know, a job, but create it for themselves. We can help create more than that. We can have a greater impact. That's the reason we're calling for stakeholders. We really want to join. Don't hesitate. We're ready for you and we need your assistance. We need your collaboration. Thank you so much. And really thank you for highlighting how that even though part of this is, you know, talking to, to brands that really when it comes down to it, working on ocean-bound plastic supply chains is a human story. 
Um, and it really is about the people and the impact that's possible to create on the ground. Thank you all very much for joining me today and um, have a wonderful day.